in Australia we have the festival. Uh, that's an Australian translation of fest shrift. First of all, you don't have to be nearly dead and retiring. But secondly, you always have to choose a theme song for your entrance. And I always choose the theme from Rocky, which probably tells you all you need to know about me. I'm here to speak about my dear friend and colleague of long standing, Professor Lee Sula. I want to thank Paul and Kyle for allowing me to um, live out a little dream, which has always been to have Sue Lung here uh, at this conference for our discussion, and indeed to bring into the field contemporary Hong Kong scholarship, which despite some mythology does exist um, around Bruce Lee and his cultural legacies, but it has local inflections. I asked Sue Lung to um, lend me, in advance of his PowerPoint, a couple of images of two of his key publications. Um, the first one, Cross-Dressing in Chinese Opera, I know some of you will be aware of, is absolutely foundational, both in English language scholarship on, it's mostly about Peking Opera, I think, that book. Um, and uh, it, it's Really, I think to this day, still, Xu Lung's primary field is the study of opera. He works with the famous musicologist Yu Xu Wai on very large grants now around intangible cultural heritage. Uh, the dispersal and revival of operas, plural, in China. Yes? Right. So, um, but he's also really appropriate for us here today. Uh, to end our conference because his work, in his work, the study of music, the study of performance, and the study of film uh, converge profoundly. In uh, a fairly early in my time at Ingham, I went there in 2000, we had the challenge of raising a little bit of money to have a research centre. And through some personal wangshi of our president, contacts, this and that, we got uh, some funding from the famous Cantonese opera singer, Fong Yun Fun, who has a foundation, the Kwon Fong Foundation, which she shares with another very famous Hong Kong personality, Maria Lee of Maria's Cakes, chain of cake stores. And we thought this is perfect for a cultural studies centre because you have high art in the local, the form of the legendary Cantonese opera singer, and someone who made everybody's favourite cakes. And they have a charitable foundation together. To celebrate having secured a little bit of funding from the Quan Fong Charitable Foundation, we instituted a lecture, the annual uh, Fong Yin Fun Distinguished, Distinguished Lecture in Cultural Studies. And it seemed completely suitable that the first one should be given by Xu Lung, particularly since it would give him an opportunity to talk about Cantonese opera, cross-dressing in Cantonese opera. And I will never forget to this day seeing Hong Yin Fun come into the auditorium. Matt said to us yesterday about Bruce Lee being the kind of superstar that Hong Kong cinema had never known. Believe me, Fong Yin Fun was a superstar. This tiny little elderly woman appeared at the top, resplendent in red and gold. And watching her walk down, it was like the kind of golden halo on a medieval painting, watching it <coughs> as she came to the front of the room. Um, and her presence, simply by being there, changed what it was possible to say around not just cross-dressing, which is a very specific topic, as I'm sure most of you know, but around sexuality and cross-dressing, which uh, Sue Lung addressed in his lecture. And she sat there in beamed approval as Sue Lung discussed some of the sexual intrigues that had marked the history of Japanese opera. And the business professors who were sitting right in front of me going, <coughs> <coughs> had to shut up every <laughs> single, every time Fong Yin Fan. Beamed approval at Xu Lung. 
a homophobe shut down. It was extraordinary. But one of the most moving things, and I don't think Sheila knows this, is that I was sitting next to a fluent Cantonese speaker, Professor John Ernie, and after about 10 minutes into Sheila's lecture, he turned to me with his mouth open and he said, you can almost never hear Cantonese like that. High literate academic Cantonese. You don't know that. And he was gobsmacked. And so were lots of other people. Not everybody knows that you can actually write Cantonese, um, but almost nobody can anymore. He spoke written Cantonese, and it brought tears to a few of your colleagues' eyes. Following this, however, um, this is my last introductory point, but perhaps uh, for you the most important, there was some discussion yesterday of how is it, why is it that Hong Kong has finally started moving around research on Bruce Lee? And we can think of many things, including the influence of work uh, in this group. But it is significant and I think absolutely uh, transformative that in 2012, um, around the time Donald Chung made a policy speech, uh, which was finally raising some interest in heritage and uh, so on. Su Leung, um, with the benefit of a grant from the Hong Kong Heritage Museum, um, was strongly involved in the research for this book, which I really recommend those of you who can should try to get hold of Bruce Lee, Kung Fu, Art and Life. And five years ago, his primary introductory essay was called The Bruce Lee Cultural Imprint. Um, he's deeply, deeply learned uh, on this subject, and I will now hand over to him to give his lecture, which has a very long title, <laughs> and I'm going to look it up shamelessly. Another lesson of Bruce Lee, martial arts poetics, and Mencius' dialectic of heart, mind, labour, body. See you later. Thank you very much, Megan. My um, senpai, I mean, I usually, um, my senior um, colleague, uh, senpai, I mean, has a special meaning, a very respectful meaning in Japanese. Uh, my, oh yeah, Lao Ka Leo Zhang Bui. I mean, that, that movie, so was, I'm the, kind of an apprentice. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for uh, introducing me to uh, Paul and this group of very energetic, very passionate, very devoted, uh, scholars, intellectuals, and experts in other fields who all love Bruce Lee and martial arts. And then my big thank you to Paul for having me here. It, I mean, and, and, well, it's the second day. So um, yesterday, I mean, until now, um, one and a half day, it's been extremely exciting. It, I mean, and all the space is full of emotional content. Because of your passion, I mean, well, you are not ordinary fans of Bruce Lee or any icon or anything because you are intellectuals, you are experts, you are professionals. So your devotion or enthusiasm or passion for an icon, idol, celebrity is intellectual plus emotional. So, well, that links to uh, part of the content that I'm going to, to talk about. Uh, so uh, let me not waste time and uh, let me move into it. Um, now, the first thing um, that I felt a little bit um, um, challenging or a little bit scared is, I mean, by being uh, invited to these uh, conferences, I never practiced martial arts. I never learned anything about martial arts. I'm not a um, um, I'm a sporty person, so oh, I know that, I mean, 99% of you have learned martial arts some for a very long time, so first thing. And the second thing is that after these one and a half days, I uh, kept thinking, is there any important lines from Bruce Lee that you haven't quoted? <laughs> is there any most important scenes that you haven't clipped, you haven't shown us? So there is one that I, I have one to show you. <laughs> okay, now, um, yeah, it is a very long title. Um, another lesson of Bruce Lee, martial arts poetics and Mencius dialectic of heart, mind, labor, body. Now, oh, I should move this. Um, actually, 
The uh, last part is just uh, being uh, pretentious. Uh, <laughs> I think I should just leave it like that, not in the slide mode. Uh, I will address Mensch's uh, line, much quoted line, in connection to Bruce Lee and my relation with Bruce Lee as growing up in Hong Kong, and then as a uh, film, I mean, as an academic who also worked on film and write something on him. Um, so martial arts poetics is my main thing. I try to read. Uh, Bruce Lee's most important stuff in the context of traditional Chinese poetics. So, let me begin. Uh, Bruce Lee is a very readerly and very writerly cultural text. Bruce Lee, as a cultural text, is very open, and yet at the same time, he has attracted people to read him as he expected people to read him. Well, that is my interpretation of that, not the objective truth. Okay, now, Bruce Lee has no lack of reading from any contemporary cultural theories. Most recently, we have a lot of someone something as method. Just a couple of hours ago, from Wayne, we have Bruce Lee as methods. But previously, before this Bruce Lee as methods, first we have the uh, Taiwan and International Inter-Asia Cultural Studies scholar Chen Guangxing, Asia as method. Uh, not Asian, I'm sorry. Asia as method is a typo. Now, this has been a very influential book. It came up in 2010. Anti-imperialism. Uh, no, no, no. De-imperializing. The whole discourse of cultural analysis and is the central theme of this book. And then, um, OK, uh, Hong Kong-based scholar Stephen U. Y. Chu. Also in the same year, 2010, came up with this article, uh, Branding Hong Kong, a Brand Hong Kong Asians World City as Method. And uh, most recently, Daryl Joji Maeda, an article published in American Quarterly, Nomad of the Trans-Pacific, Bruce Lee as Method. <laughs> okay, Bruce, yeah. Now, I'm trying to use a slightly method here. But I mean, nothing special. I just attempt at reading Bruce Lee in terms of traditional Chinese poetics, as I just say. Uh, but I mean, for what purpose? Not so much to further enrich Bruce Lee as cultural text, because he's already rich enough, too rich. It is not so much about that as to explore another lesson of Bruce Lee. That is, what can I learn from Bruce Lee that haven't been happened, haven't been uh, talked about, haven't been discussed? And uh, also trying to use a more traditional method, just to put it in traditional culture and see what happened and try to make some connections. And also, personally, for the pleasure of reading on the part of the reader interpreter, that is me, because I found it very, very pleasurable to read Bruce Lee in this way. Okay, now I'm going to enjoy myself. Now it is a retake on Bruce Lee, retake on Bruce Lee, the master of the Kung Fu body, as a reminder of the necessity of thinking and reading via an aesthetic discourse of traditional Chinese literary poetics. This method is to look back to cultural traditions for something useful, usable here and now. Now, my beginning is from my own heart. That is, I think that that should mean something to me, and at the same time, it should also mean something to a lot of other people. Now, uh, the, my act of reading focuses on the intellectual side of Bruce Lee, not the martial Bruce Lee. Why the intellectual side? Now, because in Kung Fu movies, ever since the rise of Kung Fu movies, 1970, um, Wong Yu's a Chinese boxer from Shaw Brothers and so on, that predated, actually, uh, the big boss. But of course, the big boss, Bruce Lee, was the one who bring Kung Fu movie to international dimension. Okay. Now, ever since that, I mean, most Kung Fu movies, uh, it's, there is a kind of patriotism, Chinese patriotism, nationalism, that is so blinded and so overheated that there often runs a theme of anti-intellectualism. That is, all problems to save China, to bring, uh, to restore China, you just use your body and your Kung Fu and that's it. I mean, to me, a person who reads books, that's, oh, okay. I'm... So I need to think about other things. Now, Bruce Lee, among all the Kung Fu action stars, is the only one who carries an intellectual aura. So up to this point, nobody else. Now, there are two constructions of Bruce Lee, we can say. I connect this to the Chinese tradition of everybody knows, OK, Wen Wu. I'm using uh, Mandarin here, OK, Wen Wu. The first, uh, in, in, in the Chinese syntax, the Wen 
that is uh, the scholarly comes first in the Chinese syntax. When Wu, okay, the Wu in my PowerPoint is uh, the military, okay? Now, in terms of the military, Bruce Lee is a master movie actor, martial artist, okay? And then the scholarly is an avid reader. Now, if you check internet, uh, especially the, the, the English one, wow, there's so many people, even bookstores, they construct an image of, of course, it has a lot to do with reality. I'm not saying that it is a false image. So there's so many people saying that, oh, Bruce Lee has 2,500 books in the library, and what books he has, something like that. I mean, in, in the Western uh, community, or in the English-speaking community, Bruce Lee's intellectual or scholarly image is, is, is quite prominent. But in the Chinese-speaking com Chinese community, it is uh, of a lesser degree. There are, of course, many people online talk about that. But the common people, the ordinary people, the people in the street, the moviegoers, Bruce Lee is a fighting guy. And this is my favorite picture and image of Bruce Lee. I'm going to go to this in a moment. Now, in the, <laughs> in, in the Chinese tradition, we have a common saying, an idiomatic saying. Someone who is complete in both one and Wu. So, well, Bruce Lee as a martial artist actor, uh, have achieved that in my view. Okay, next. Now let me let me put uh, the action star in kung fu movies in the Chinese speaking context with special reference to Hong Kong. That is a, a Cantonese speaking community. So we have a phrase. I try to translate it. It's difficult, but I talk, uh, yeah, it's really a touch screen. Sorry. Um, I thought it was you were joking, but okay. <laughs> Now, there is a very common term. Now it is, uh, well, Hong Kong has become more civilized. Uh, uh, no, I mean more elitist in a way. So that is less frequently used. But when I was a kid back in the 70s and so, in all those entertainment magazines and so on, when they talk about the Kung Fu fighting stars, they, uh, some, a lot of times they use this term. Uh, in Cantonese, 打仔, 明星 is star. Okay, 打仔, 打仔 is fight, fight guy, fighting guy. So it is a little bit, um, not too, I mean, it is very colloquial. Uh, very popular, so da zai is not that good. But okay, the standard term, we uh, martial arts fighting star. So there's only only one character difference. But this is a standard term. There's no evaluation. The first one, da zai. So it is. Mm, mm, you when only fight, it's just like a soccer boo. I mean, in in Cantonese, we have this term soccer boo. Uh, I I know that uh, World Cup soccer is right now. Okay, the final the final. Now. And even more respectful is uh, action star. So what I'm trying to say is that, uh, co re uh, connecting to what I just said, because of the uh, screen representation of most kung fu and sword playing movies, emphasize so much about the physical, po uh, physical power as solution. So the general public, the ordinary people's perception of the action stars is that, okay, they fight, they don't read books. Uh, they are not intellectuals. And a lot of times they are associated with tri society and something. So that is a very bad perception and construction of the uh, so called uh, military or martial side of those action actors, kung fu actors. Now, we talked about advertisement, TV commercials earlier on. I am going to further elaborate this with a, an example a TV commercial. 1972. The Way of Dragon was released. I am old enough to catch, I am very old actually, <laughs> to catch this right there. So I was a kid. Uh, of course, the whole family went to watch the movie. And at that time, there was a TV commercial, Winston Cigarettes commercial. Uh, nobody could find that out, I, I, I checked. And then some, some chat rooms in English said, oh, well, I, I read something there about this uh, TV commercial. Do you have any more information? About you, you do have the commercial? Okay, okay, yeah. Now, in, in this, I, I also do the translation. My, when I was a kid, I watched the Cantonese version, I mean, on Cantonese TV. That is a very colloquial expression in Cantonese. In English, is you talk about fighting, fighting, of course it's Bruce Lee who is formidable, he's the best. Now, I must emphasize that the, the Cantonese use is a colloquial one. Why? Bruce Lee is why? Why is not just good or excellent, it is, ah, okay. Now, and if you talk about uh, smoking cigarettes, I try to do the more uh, literal translation and following the original syntax. So smoking cigarettes, of course it's Winston, but okay. And it's Bolo, yeah, uh, Bolo, yeah, wow, it's the big guy who, who speaks in the Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee appeared in it. Uh, I mean, 
uh, in the TV commercial, we see clips from the way of the dragon. Now, so from, from this TV commercial, we can see that back then the dominant image as perceived by the general public is Da Zai. So those are the people who are who are not intellectual. Yeah, they are very good at this, they can entertain people, but okay. So next. Now, what about the Manchester thing? Now, to me, I of course I, I enjoy, I admire the Bruce Lee. I am not qualified as a Bruce Lee fan. I have to be very humble because I believe that to be qualified as a Bruce Lee fan, you need a lot more attributes, like learning Kung Fu or otherwise. Now, and I was a kid, of course I admire him. And uh, I enjoy all the action movies. I still enjoy all the, all the action movies, of course. But I mean, as, as, as an academic, well, I, I rethink about it. So what, 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 what can I learn from all those action movies? And a long time ago, I already associated Manchester's this line with the experience of watching Kung Fu movies. Now, those who exercise their heart mind rule. Those who exercise their labor body are rude. Now, if it is line, two lines are taken out of context, then wow, so politically incorrect. It is so elitist, it is so feudalistic. So it reinforces an unequal power hierarchy in society. So uh, that has been one major attack of Mencius uh, in the mainland. Um, but at the same time, of course, in the mainland or in the academic world, people put it back in the um, context of this whole essay, this whole essay in the book Mencius. Now, in this book, actually, in very, very brief ways, okay, so okay. So in the Warring States period in China, that is the time when Mencius, Confucius lived, there are many, many different schools of thoughts. And one of the schools of thoughts is called the Farmer's School. That is, they argue that, okay, even the emperor, even a very good emperor, benevolent ruler, he should farm with the people so that he can be considered a really great emperor. And that man said, no, I don't agree with that. We have division in society. People have different roles. So some people do this, some people do that. But so that is the one of the examples that Manchus used to illustrate his point, that is we have division in society. But of course, this example by itself is uh, problematic. But in order to uh, save Manchus, elsewhere, Manchus says something that is one of the most quotable quotes from Manchus, that is, the people are the precious. The emperor is the lightness. I try to be literal in my translation. So now what I'm thinking is, Bruce Lee, an, as an example, should give people, or young people even, an encouragement that, okay, learn Kung Fu, fine. But at the same time, you read books, you study. Now, a fact is that almost all of you here do Kung Fu or some form of martial arts and you are, now, we, are, we live in a society that has higher hierarchy, okay? This is a piece of fact, no matter what our cultural values or social values are. Now, we are elitist, in a sense, in society. So, you are successful. You do Kung Fu. You read books, you study. So, what are we as educators, I mean, back in the Hong Kong context, say to the uh, young students, okay. Uh, in the last two years, I work at the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts as the dean of the School of Chinese Opera. So that is a professional training school, the only one or training performing there. So every day they just, okay, you play the flute, okay, 10 hours, you don't do anything else. And then the, the, the dean of the School of Music say, our students are so busy practicing there. Don't do the humanities subjects. Don't do the agenda courses. Well, of course, in this system, there are 20% of uh, humanities and genetic courses that any of the drama major or whoever, you must take, okay? But then the, the, the direction of this kind of performing arts, performing martial arts, sports people, you just do that sports people, don't, don't talk knowledge, okay? Wow, I was so frustrated uh, working there. Well, that's part of the reason. Now, so this is a lesson that I personally take from uh, Bruce Lee. Now, I really love this. 
This is the translator, compiler, and editor of this book. This book is a source book in Chinese philosophy, Princeton U Press, 1963. The name Chen is here. But of course, I mean, I, I came from a comparative literature background, East-West, so-called East-West comparative literature. This term is already politically incorrect, East-West. OK, so everybody knows, uh, respect this great uh, scholar. Now, um, Professor Chen Wing Chit, uh, he passed away in 1994. He was 92 when he passed away. Um, he belongs to the group of Asian scholars who teach in American universities, and some of them got PhDs from university before and after the Second World War. And some of my professors, when I went to grad school in the United States, were students of this generation of uh, Chinese Asian scholars teaching in the United States. Now, Professor Chen Wingti has a close connection, uh, not close, I mean, some kind of connection with us and Megan. He graduated from Lingnan University <laughs> in the early 20th century. And then he came to the United States and he got a Harvard PhD. And then he stayed in the United States and I mean, most of the career he stayed this here and teach. And in his later years, uh, most of the time he taught at Columbia University. And before the war, he was also appointed dean of Lingnan College something, okay. So he who speaks and writes in philosophical, philosophical words is also the unique guy in Kung Fu movies who looked philosophical. And it's only Bruce Lee who can do that, or who has done that. All other, I mean Donnie Yen, all the great fighter, Jet Li, Jackie Chan is totally no intellectualism. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, so. Now, next, I mean, here is, I mean, books, books is wonderful. Now, this is the only book, this is the only book that uh, Bruce Lee published when he was alive, during his lifetime, the only book, his first book. He also published an article, what, uh, the karate, uh, let's, uh, what, free ourselves from classic karate, that's the article, what has been very influential. And then some editorial responses to letters to editor and so on. So that's, uh, most of his works, or 99% is posthumous, compiled and edited. Now in this book, something very interesting is, the English title is, the emphasis is philosophical, yeah, philosophical art. But I have no knowledge of real martial arts. But based on what I read, <laughs> um, back in the 1990s, some Bruce Lee fans in Hong Kong, I mean, of course, he, he has a lot of fans, and, but Hong Kong never claimed Bruce Lee. I, I'm not sure Hong Kong will claim Bruce Lee in the future. But anyway, now, those fans are very, very rational. So they love Bruce Lee, they're crazy about Bruce Lee, but they also pointed out that a oh, part of this book copied two martial art books in Chinese. With full citation, oh, okay. But it doesn't matter, all right? It, it really doesn't matter. The only thing matter is, well, why is Bruce Lee so influential? Why is he so attractive? Why is he so charismatic? Chari what? Charisma. Charismatic. <laughs> yeah, charismatic. So, now, what about the Chinese title? Of course, this book is in English. It has a Chinese translation. And the Chinese title is simply Fundamental Chinese Boxing method, okay, kun, the fist, fist method. There's no philosophy, nothing of that thing. Now, what I try, try to, what I try, what I'm trying to point out is, Bruce Lee, all his life, not all his life. I mean, after he trying to come, come out and make a name of himself, he emphasized that I studied philosophy. No, he didn't. He was a drama major. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it make make him even. Greater, I think, okay, he studied drama at Washington, Seattle. He didn't finish it. It doesn't matter. Uh, so many big names, that were Scott Job, Jobs, uh, Steve Jobs, they, were all, they, they, they didn't finish So, But we need to clarify the facts and things. So everything's philosophical. So Bruce Lee is philosophical. Of course, he took philosophy courses. And he speaks philosophically. Although the content of what he said to me is, oh, okay, ordinary. Everybody knows. But it doesn't matter again. Now, I'm going to illustrate why. Now, Bruce Lee is a Kung Fu action star who looks philosophical. Uh, four comments. One, point one. His publications, his words are all in English. All in English. Okay? 
He never published anything in, in China. I mean, because all his books are in English. Right? Now, he sounds cool and attractive and charming in English. He cannot be translated into Chinese and sound cool. Now, we have Chinese people here. Now, okay, we will, we will do the um, exercise later. Now, like this one. Don't think. Feel. In Chinese, come on. Buyasukao. Gan show. Wow. Any any anyone who is a native. Yes, 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 yes. Mona, Mona. I I I just use Putonghua. I mean it doesn't it gong gong uh uh in Cantonese uh mho lam yet. Gam sao. Ah, okay. But in Japanese it's it's great. Kanae kanai eluna. Kanji lunda. Kanai eluna. Kanji lunda. I don't know Japanese. I'm just fond of memorizing those one-liners for fun. Uh, and, and this line appears in Japanese TV dramas, Japanese movies, everywhere. TV commercials, too. Um, oh, yeah. Point two is that uh, just work in English and Japanese, okay. And it, it sounds cool in Japanese, too. Now, this is a, a book published in the early 1990s. In Japan, it's a Japanese book. It is a uh, Bruce Lee special issue. Uh, of course, this is Enter the Dragon. Now, Kangai Eruna, Kanji Runda, Ocha! Now, here is the pun. Ocha! Okay, do you want some tea? <laughs> it's last time. Now, the, the Japanese, I mean, oh, oh, do you want some tea? Ocha, okay. Now this is achoo! so that is the Bruce Lee cat's uh, what that is that's ocha so that's uh, the Japanese are very very uh, clever people. Now the the artist is Kajuya Terada, so he's a very famous uh, cartoonist doing all this. So I'm just trying to point out. Oh, this is the cover to point out that he. I mean Bruce Lee sounds cool in Japanese. Now. Bruce Lee's sights, actually. Bruce Lee didn't invent anything I mean, about philosophy and his sights. And his sights only. Uh, he rarely adds something of his own. But once again, it doesn't matter. But I must illustrate here a little bit. Now, the usefulness of the cup is in its emptiness. From Liberate Yourself from Classical Karate, Bruce Lee, 1971. The original Laozi, more than 2,000 years old. Clay is molded into a vessel because of the hollow. We may use a cup. Bruce Lee, don't think, feel. It's like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. I have the advantage of having a Hong Kong accent. So. <laughs> now Buddha, seeing someone's finger pointing to the moon, a simpleton looks at the finger, but not the moon. Now, here's our order citation. Okay? But I can only refer to the uh, Chinese Buddhist scripts, not Sanskrit. Right. <laughs> now, I really love this one. Everybody loves this one, right? I don't need to read it. Formless shape. Be water, my friend is. I, have, I don't think I have time to go into be water, but if later on. If I now, here is the uh, Musashi, originally says, Taking water as a model, one makes the mind like water. Water follows the form of either the angular or round container and becomes either a drop or a great sea. So this is from Musashi, and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, any problem about that? I have been repeating that. That's not the problem. That's not the problem. Now, because especially, now I'm suggesting that we put Bruce Lee in our traditional Chinese poetics to read him, then it is zero problem. Now, because in the traditional Chinese literary criticism, <laughs> because in Chinese literary criticism tradition, uh, people don't footnote. People don't care about whether you transform, you borrow, uh, you steal, you plagiarize from anybody. Because everyone knows, those scholar gentry class people, they, are, they read all the same books. They know who copies. If you copied well, great. 
I praise you in all the poetry criticism that we have. I mean, all those texts. If you do it badly, they will say, oh, you just plagiarized someone. <laughs> I am not here to quote some original lines, but I'm telling you that this, this is the thing. Now, uh, what about format and style of poetry criticism in China? It's aphoristic, it's episodic, it's in short paragraph. It is not consistent, it is not a monograph, it's not systematic building. It is impressionistic, quote unquote, okay, not painting impressionism, but just saying something abstract and impressionistic that anyone can say, like, oh, it is like the moon in the water. So anyone can say it without explaining. There's no, elabor no elaboration, no explaining, okay. And terms are not used, do it not used precisely. They just throw out all the high sounding terms without defining the terms so you find it out by yourself. And there was a huge influence of Zen Buddhism from the 7th to the 12th century in literary uh, criticism in China. And the criticism texts that we have on poetry and on drama, Chinese drama, they are often called poetry talk. In Chinese, si hua, si hua, okay, anyway, poetry talk or drama talk because they are episodic and so on. Now, and another point is, what we have as modern people, the concept of authorship, is a modern invention in the West. It's two, three hundred years old or something. And even in the medieval Europe, in medieval Europe, authorship was understood differently. In China, authorship is, I mean, it's a big, big, big topic for Asian studies. Now, let me cite towards one example. Here is a very famous critic from the 11th century, and in his book of poetry talk, he put forward a method, the method in translation, tempering with the iron, turning it into gold, snatching the embryo and changing the bones, a meaning to transform things. I mean, the embryo is, is the literal translation. So this is a method of creative writing. That's you adapt, you borrow, you transform some existing text. I mean, those postmodernists, oh, everything is a quotation. Okay, you quote and quote and quote. Every, uh, the meaning of each word is depending on other words and so on. So, and so, what about Bruce Lee? Let's put it in this way. Bruce Lee reads, mainly in English. He applies. He doesn't footnote. And he applies excellently. Now, because his words work, the original words do not work. Do not work in the sense not in the intellectual world, not in the academy. The original words from all those saints or Mushashi or everybody, they are not commonly circulated among the common people. But Bruce Lee's words can reach or move the common people. Now, Justin, uh, Sally, yeah, uh, presentation on uh, advertisement. So you also played us the uh, Johnny Walker 2013 TV commercial. Of course, when I, when I watched it, I was, oh, come on. It was targeted at those suddenly wealthy mainlanders who flocked to Hong Kong to buy flats, apartments, and so on. I mean, the whole style of the thing, it was not for Hong Kong people, it was for, for those very wealthy people from the mainland. And then the Mandarin thing. But no, that is not the problem. I watched it again when you played it and said, oh, because the voiceover, is a very badly garbled, supposed to be Bruce Lee style stuff, but it, it, it doesn't work, it's totally trash. Other examples of the uh, TV commercials that Sally played as are uh, quoted directly from Bruce Lee or cutting it up and then repatch it. But that Johnny Walker thing is a, I mean, a writer, a script writer wrote the whole thing uh, imitating the Bruce Lee style, but it is trash. That's they should use the original Bruce Lee word. I mean, this is the biggest scene to a uh, Bruce Lee. I'm not qualified as a fan. I mean, for someone who respects and admires Bruce Lee. Okay. Now, uh, Bruce Lee's martial art theorization evokes in my mind uh, conceptualization similar to originative or originary Chinese poetics of lyricism and Chinese poetics of expressive theory. But of course, expressive theory is also in the West, but the originary uh, poetics in Europe was first uh, originated from drama, but in China is from poetry. So that is a comparative poetics thing. I will not go into details here now. Um, 
ruthless discourse on the Tao of the Marshal, that is the Budo. Yeah, that, that's the term that one of you used. So let me say a little bit about it now. We can read Bruce Lee's theory of the Tao of martial art in the context of literary po uh, poetics. That is, it is a kind of expressive theory, the kind of expressive theory that we see in poetry. And it is also to be, according to Bruce Lee, martial arts is also for understanding and knowledge. Now, this is also in uh, a theory in aesthetics. Now, let me cite some lines from Bruce Lee to uh, substantiate what I'm arguing here. Now, in Bruce Lee, Artists of Life, in this book, he says, art is communication of feelings. Also, another quote, art must originate with an experience for feeling of the artist. Another quote, much pseudo art comes from insincerity or the attempt to create a work of art that does not grow from actual experience of feeling. And then in the book, Wisdom for the Way, here is another quotation, art is really the expression of the self. And another quotation from the Tao, uh, from another book, Bruce Lee's commentaries on the martial way. Quote, art must originate with an experience of feeling of the artist. There must be emotional expression or emotional content in your technique. And so on and so forth, there are more. Now, the uh, posthumous edited volumes by Bruce Lee actually take the form of something like poetry talk. Similar ideas appear here and there, short passages, sometimes even just one line circle with no circumference, and so on and so forth. It is in form and in essence much like poetry talk. Now, what about the content? Now, if you look back at the uh, very, very first piece that a lot of the people who study Chinese poetics must refer to is this one. Okay. Poetry is where the intent of the heart or mind, that is some scene, okay, goes. Lying in the heart or mind, it is intent. When uttered in words, is poetry. When an emotion stirs inside, one expresses it in words. Finding this inadequate, one sighs over it. Not content with this, one sings it in poetry. Still not satisfied, one unconsciously dances with one's hands and feet. Now, this is literal translation, following the original images and the syntax. Of course, you can dance. But you can do martial arts, hands and feet. But this is my stretching interpretation. But here is the uh, theory, and I mean the poetics. OK, uh, I think I will over. I mean, now, I want to say something about the enter the dread two scenes, OK? Um, but I combine them two. Now, the, the pedagogy scene, that is a, the master and apprentice, uh, you, you don't need to watch it, right? Everyone knows. <laughs> now, um, there are two aspects of this scene. First, it is actually an expression of an utmost pragmatic martial art practice. Bruce Lee in the scene is teaching the apprentice, who is Dong Wai. He is now a very successful choreo uh, action choreographer and award winning. Anyway, so Bruce Lee is teaching a very pragmatic way when you fight, when you combat. Don't pack. Don't even uh, don't take your eyes off your opponent, even when you bow. This is this is most practical. Okay, now um, point two. But conceptually, this it is uh, framed in the language of Chinese poetics. That is more specifically in expressive theory and Zen poetics. Okay, um, here is the scene is an interaction between a master and a, an apprentice. So, kick me. Ah, what was that? An exhibition? Try again. I, I mean, all of us could recite that, right? Okay. Now here we have. <laughs> now, martial art as sport. So it is all about physical technique, right? If you look at it now, martial art as game or exhibition means that it has no meaning. So this is the difference between ballet and uh, what uh, gymnastics, right? I mean, I'm trying to understand this line uh, as do it again, and, and and then we need emotional content, not anger. We need emotional anger. So this is this is actually aesthetics theory. That is, what is the difference between dance as art or martial art as art, and just boxing 
or uh, skating because there is meaning in that or art challenges us try to read some meaning into it. So that is the concept that I want to bring into in order to read that. When Bruce Lee says, we need emotional content, not anger, pa, another thing. Okay, two, two times of hitting the head. Now this is a Jain Buddhism thing. This is directly in, the, in Zen Buddhism, when you try to enlighten an apprentice, you hit it with a club, pa, so on the head. So it's a dong tao pang hot. I mean, a dong tao pang. Dong tao yi ma, yeah, pa. Now, we need emotional content. Now, one, one interpretation of emotional content from the pragmatic sense is, let me quote, uh, sorry, uh, um, let me quote, uh, okay, Terry Tom, the straight lead. Now, in a book, Tom elaborates that, in the heat, quote, in the heat of battle, there is no time to think. The more steps needed for an attack, the more time is wasted in thought. According to Bruce, simplicity is what makes an attack unbeatable. The irony, of course, is that the simplest punch is actually the most difficult to master. This is the paradox of simplicity. I like Terry Tons. Simplicity. Is that right? So what do I mean by the pragmatic aspect of it? Don't think, feel, means that, ah, sorry. In, in, in fighting, you have to do this. There's no time to think. You just feel, you just fight, you just punch. That is a practical aspect of it. Now, what about conceptually, theoretically? Let me just go back. Um, okay, in addition to this, you don't think, you just feel in fighting, is you get so-called emotionally involved. That is connected to this very prominent uh, Bruce Lee uh, pedagogy. Now, let me quote uh, Ino Santo, Dan Ino Santo. Um, in one of his essays, got Bruce Lee as seen through the eyes of students of Jit Kune Do. Uh, quote, this was uh, Bruce's ways of teaching. Instead of having you do 500 kicks, he would get you emotionally involved in 10 kicks. So, we need emotional content, not anger. That is one way to understand it. Now, what about another way? Now, emotional content is something that is abstract, that cannot be named, that cannot be described in words. Now, empty Kato, okay, Kato Kato, I sometimes mix. Okay, now, empty Kato in his book from uh, Kung Fu to Hip Hop sets, uh, the shamanic expression in Enter the Dragon defies the mediation of the signifying category, for example, wrath, fury, rage, etc., retaining an imminently raw state of affective force in his emotional expression. Now, this is uh, Cato's uh, reading of the emotional content, what kind of emotion you, you feel in the Bruce Lee, because Bruce Lee did not describe the emotional content. Now, Emo emotional content is something abstract that cannot be named, but you have to do it with meaning, because at the end, uh, not at the end, toward the end, I said, now to try again with meaning, and then don't like cakes again, and then how do you feel? Let me think, pa, pa again. Don't concentrate. It is like a finger pointer, and then don't concentrate on the finger, or you will blah blah blah. Now that is Zen Buddhism. First point, there is no definition of emotional content. It is exactly like in classical Chinese poetry, the highest realm when a poem reaches is that there's no meaning, there's nothing. You forget everything. And the second thing that I, I want to, I mean in my conclusion, to uh, bring out is when we talk about this kind of expressive theory that is from within, it originates from within. So we have this emotion, this qing qing, and then we express it. Right? But Bruce Lee's uh, formulation of it, if we compare and contrast the poetic tradition and Bruce Lee's words, it is something like, let me go to the, that is in my uh, abstract. Let me go to that first. If I have more time, I will go to the other side. So, now, 
as much as Bruce Lee's foregrounding of ultimately martial art means honestly expressing yourself and the need of emotional content with meaning, a major difference between Lee's, Lee's conceptualization and the classical Chinese poetics of emotion is that while emotion is essentially prior to the existence of the subject, that is, in the tradition of Chinese poetics, this is the position, this is the concept. But Bruce Lee's emotional content, which to me is intangible. Now, this intangible emotional content is an embedding affective atmosphere around the formation of subjectivity through form. That is, the martial arts subject stands inside the practice, embedding theory and knowledge and governs practice from within. So there is a unity of practice and knowledge which creates a subject that expresses itself in holistic performances. That is, Bruce Lee doesn't say that your emotional content comes from the inner part of your heart. Bruce Lee's subject is standing in space, drawing together the interior and the exterior. That is, extending the emotional content into space. So when he points the finger, he extends emotional content to a vast space. So this is different than uh, what I quoted from uh, Chinese poetics. When you have intent in your heart, when you want to express it, you use poetry and so on. So it all originates from here. So Bruce Lee's formulation is, to me, is interesting when it is in contrast to Chinese traditional poetics. Now, because of the time, let me go to my last slide. I skip some heavenly glory. <laughs> <laughs> now, here, because we are going to have some time, I, I mean, I'm, I'm Megan, we're feeling. So ultimately, I intentionally omit the subject. Okay? Read, write, and discourse. Everything epitomizes in the figure of a fighter who reads books. Uh, this is from um, uh, Game of Death. I don't know, uh, Tower. Uh, originally, but, but uh, uh, Tower of Death, not Game of Death, Tower of Death. And in a movie, Bruce Lee is reading his own book. <laughs> I need to check again. That, that is about his death, and then uh, there's a conspiracy. So uh, but this is what I uh, conclude. This is read books. Um, I, yeah. Okay, uh, so <laughs> thank you both. This wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation. I, um, I'm just going to say a couple of things, I suppose, to translate it back to some of the institutional contexts that we're living now, or that some of us live in now. Um, I'm not, I haven't heard this talk before, I didn't know, I'm, so I'm extemporizing. Um, but what will stay with me very powerfully is that Tulon has given us, in a, a non-kitschy way, uh, a Bruce Lee who is a reader and a theorist and practitioner of creative writing in a mode which can be given a traditional Chinese history but also resonates um, both with and goes against the grain of uh, today's academic understandings of what creative writing is, the authorization of, of writing, and how you handle this question of how books or like uh, statements, articles, aphorisms, by Bruce Lee that have inspired millions around the world. They're all like copied fragments and debris of 2,000 years of other people's writing. Uh, and how the creative force of that comes to be what we emphasize, rather than, oh, uh, Bruce Lee was a plagiarist or whatever. I think this is actually a very important issue. and. Um, as somebody who after you know five years is still struggling to readapt to life in Australia rather than Hong Kong where my heart still is, uh, I can make a little link by 
I suppose elaborating a bit of this idea of X's method that Xilin started with, not just Bruce Lee as method, but uh, Chen Quanqing Asia as method, a very powerfully influential book, which has set off intellectual movements all around uh, Asia in general, I would say, because the inter Asia movement now includes South Asia and Southeast Asia as well as the East Asian world. And the interesting thing about the idea of X as method, for those of you who haven't heard this story, is that it originates with the Japanese sinologists just after World War II, who were struggling with the defeat, which was supposed to be unthinkable. And a small group of them, instead of doing what many Japanese intellectuals did at that time, which was burrow into theories of Nihonjiron and Japanese-ness and, and a kind of mirror game with the idea of Asian studies that was being produced for military strategic reasons at the time in the US. They looked to China uh, to understand what had happened in Japan. There's a very famous essay by uh, Takuchi Yoshimi called Asia as Method, um, which was I think in the early 60s it, it was written. And it has a little bit of this wonderful model of intellectuality that we've just been hearing about. Takuchi's essay, which is valuable in English, <coughs> excuse me, he says, well, look, I, you know, I was never a very good student. I can't really organise my thoughts very well. Uh, I messed around at university, didn't go to lectures. But I got interested in China, but then the war came. It's very anecdotal. And then it starts to build power when he, in the 60s, looks back at the famous comparison between China and Japan written by the American philosopher Dewey in the 1990-1920 period. At a time where orthodox opinion was that, you know, Japan really had its act together. It's going to be a model of modernization and success. Uh, whereas China was dirty and a mess, and warlords, and everything was grubby and hideous and primitive. And Dewey, at the beginning, believed this, but then he went and lived and watched what was happening empirically. And he said, actually, it's the other way around, I think, that China, yes, is struggling, um, but the struggle is, I don't think the word was authentic, but it is rising from the needs of the people. And China will eventually produce a modernity that has integrity. Whereas Japan, all of this modernization stuff is cosmetic. Underneath, nothing is changing because it isn't coming from the needs of the people. And this will turn out badly. It's wonderful go back and read Dewey on that. So at the end of Asia's Method, the essay by the Japanese sinologist, he says that what he's thinking of as Asia's <coughs> Method is something like a project of the self's reformation. And the whole <coughs> point is that you don't know what kind of Asian values, what kind of Asia will be produced at the end of the processes that he's engaged with. But what is absolutely crucial is a social and emotional movement of translation. That to understand Japan, how to create a different kind of Japan, he went to China to find out what was in people's hearts there. So not to first of all look at me and my drama, but to hold my drama in suspension and go and learn deeply about other people and how they're dealing with their problems and then come back to rethink about China, uh, Japan in the age of reconstruction. I think in a way Xi Long has given us a, a, a model of how that type of translation can work in relation to an intellectual tradition, a global cinematic movement, but the one dimension that most people have in common one way or another 
the uh, disturbingly unpleasant evolution of the contemporary global academy and what it means to be intellectual in the sorts of institutions that through global policy sharing today resemble each other much more than we like to think when we talk about global specificity. Um, if we can work with uh, martial arts studies, for example, as a field that's giving us models of how to engage in cultural translation with emotional content, unnameable in its content, but that involves deep engagement with creative writing and with the reading that martial arts studies can do along with all the rest. Then I think through those vagaries of, of translation, we, we actually have at least the affective resources for some way to go on thinking, go on reading, go on fighting and still care. I personally believe that the institutional worlds that we inhabit now are all about killing your ability to do that. Uh, the Contemporary Academy fights deeply inside your soul by taking up all of your time with crap. And the more senior you become, the bigger the pile of crap. So it actually does take art, and in an extended metaphorical sense of martial art, to stay alive <coughs> as a thinking, breathing, reading, writing, fighting human being. And from Sulon's account, uh, I get, uh, I think, an enriched understanding of how Bruce Lee can help us do that. Thanks. Thank you.